Okay, thank you all for joining today's ASBMR member spotlight. This series was implemented by the ASBMR Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. And the aim of the series is to highlight the research of ASBMR members within a collaborative setting and aims in particular to shine a light on the research that's being done by ASBMR members belonging to groups that are historically underrepresented in biomedical research. Today's member spotlight will have two presenters. First, Dr. Nori Yosho Korihara, research professor at Indian University who will present on con contribute of osteo class IGF1 and osteocyte on pageant liaison formation in Paget's bone disease. And our second presenter will be John Paul Elizondo at Texas A&M Texas University College Station, who will present on jump training and thorough, I don't know how to pronounce that word, I'm sorry, <laughs> antibody treatment as preventative countermeasures to microgravity induced bone loss. Just as a reminder for both our presenters and attendees, each presentation will take approximately 15 to 20 minutes um, with Q&A from the audience afterwards. And just as a reminder, please keep yourself muted throughout the meeting and then following each presentation, when you'd like to ask your questions, feel free to unmute yourself. With that, I would like to welcome Dr. Curry Hara to begin his presentation. Okay. Uh oh, I'm not sure if we lost him. Um, Let's see if we can get him back. There we go. Can you hear us? Hi, Dr. Curry Harag, are you, are you there? Yeah, some trouble, okay. sir. No, that's okay. Your screen. There we go. I just made you a co-host. Oh, okay. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I went ahead and made you a co-host um, just so you have a, a little bit more capability there, but we can see your screen. So it's perfect. Okay. Thank you for everyone inviting to the make this presentation. This study is supported by NIMAS. We have a no conflict intellect. Paget disease is a common bone disease characterized by localized increased osteoclastic bone resorption by abnormal osteoclast, followed by rapid into the new bone formation. That is one peculiarity. The primary cellular abnormality resides in osteoclast. Osteoclast in Paget disease have a distinct phenotype that is different from normal osteoclast. Increased osteoclast number, nuclei per osteoclast, and the bone resorption capacity per osteoclast. Increased resorption capacity, increased responsibility 125D3 and vitamin D3, and TAF2 tubal expression per BDR coarchipator. Increased lung ligand TNFF responsibility. Increased IL6 production. Both genetic and environment factor has been implicated by Paget disease. P62, P392 is the most frequent mutation found in Paget disease. Paramix virus transcript has been detected in osteoclast from Paget patient. We generate a transgenic mass with measles virus nucleocapsid protein, MBNP derived by TRAP promoter. To examine if environmental factor expressed in osteoclast involved in development of Paget disease. These mice analyzed for bone formation rate by calcium labeling, histology, and histomorphometry. 
region study, region study characteristic osteoclast and osteoclast precursor from MB mice in vitro. Interestingly, trap MBNP mass at 20, 20 months old have osteoclast that increase number and size. Further, bone formation is markedly increased in trap MP mice. The bone formed was waved bone. This slide compares the characteristic osteoclast derived from paget patient and trap MP mice. Both pagetic pattern, both pagetic, both pagetic patient and MB mice osteoclast have increased osteoclast number and size, nuclear number per osteoclast, and expiration level the high of IL6, IGF1, and Fin B2 in osteoclast, and FB4 osteoclast, which increased bone formation. And the formation of pagetic region previously reported. From these results, support that trap MBNP mice are a model of osteoclast activity in pagetic disease. We also tested if P60 is a mutant contribute to pagetic disease and generated P62, P392, P94L mutant knockout mice by P60 knockout and knock-in. We found that expression of P62, P63 to 94L in mice that does not in this budgetic osteoclast or bone region in vertebral bodies. Osteoclast precursors from patient with P62, P39 L mutation are hyper response to rank ligand and TNF alpha but not 125B3, which differ from osteoclast precursor from paget patient. We, con we confirmed P62, P392L mutation predisposed, but does not in the cause pagetic disease. To further characterize the abnormal osteoclast in PD, we performed the gene expression profiling purified osteoclast from marrow culture of wild type P62, P39L knock-in mass and MBNP mice. We found IGF1 expression was significantly increased in osteoclast from MBNP mice compared to the wild type. To determine that IGF1 is the increased osteoclast in paget digit in vivo. We tested bone section from paget patient and healthy donor for IGF1 expression. Osteoclast in paget patient sample was significantly stain IGF1 compared to healthy donors, which had a weak staining osteoclast. Therefore, we determined if osteoclast derived IGF1 affects bone formation and the development of pagetic region in pagetic disease and the normal bone, remod normal bone remodeling in vivo. To pursue this question, we generated wild type and MVNP mice with target dilution of IGF1 in osteoclast by breeding trap cure or MVNP trap cure with IGF on flux mice. This result this, this retarded in four genotype mice, wild type, IGF and CKO, MVNP, and MVNP IG1 CKO mice. The top of panel show immunostaining of IGF in bone section of these mice at 20 months of age. Osteoclast from wild type MVN mice clearly stained for IGF-1. Osteoclast in MVN mice are stained strongly. In contrast, 
IGF was undetectable in IGF and CKO and MVNP IG1 CKO mice. Bottom of the left panel is showing IGF and levels of culture media from osteoclast formed in vitro after 72 hours culture. MVNP osteoclast secret high level of IGF1 compared to wild type as a genotypes. The secret level of IGF-1 in osteoclast culture media confirms our immunosecurity findings. Importantly, serum level of IGF-1 was similar in all genotypes. Interestingly, pathetic region was only detected by micro-QCT and histologic analysis of vertebra, hema, and tibia in 40% of 12 to 20 months old MBNP mice, but no positive region was seen in the other genotypes. We then determined one volume of vertebra in four genotype mice at 20 months of age. CT image in MB mice with positive region showed clearly increased bone mass compared to with other genotype or wild type mice. Vertebra a bone volume so score is for MVNP. Mice with positive region were increased twofold compared to MVNP mice with the positive region and white type mice. Notably, BBTV MVNP mice IGF and CKO and IGF and CKO mice were significantly decreased compared to the MVNP to white type mice, respectively. Top of panel show trap staining of bone section from 20 months of old mice. Osteoclast MB mice were greatly increased in size, were hyper multinucleated analog to osteoclast in budget disease, and resorption capacity were deeper MBNP mice than other genotype transmitted mice or wild type mice. Osteoclast from IGF and CKO, MVNP IG and CKO, and Y type mice displayed similar morphology and was smaller than osteoclast from MVNP mice. Just morphometric analysis and vertebra from these mice was shown in the bottom of the panel. Osteoclast and osteoclast parameter were decreased IGF and CKO and MVNP IG and CKO compared to wild type and MVNP mice. Dynamic system morphometric analysis of the bone from calcium labeling mice were also examined. Fluorescence image of the bone from these mice were shown in the top of panels. Previous of newly formed bone was markedly increased MB mice. In contrast, bone formation wild type mice were approximately half level level. MBNP mice. Although bone formation level of IGF and CKO mice were less than wild type and MBNP IGF and CKO mice. Mineralized surface, the mineralized opposition rate MBNP mice are also significantly higher than the other genotype of wild type mice. Further, mineral opposition rate and the bone formation rate our bone surface MB mice positive region was greater than MBNP without positive regions. Next, we examined if increased osteoclast IGF1 increased FLIN B2 and FB4 expression on osteoclast osteoblast in 20 months old mass by immunohistical staining of bone sections. Osteoclast and osteoblast from MBN mice positive region strongly stained for IGF and had included FLIN B2 and FB4 compared to other genotypes. To examine the effects of conditional knockout of IGF in osteoclast and osteoclast precursors, we cultured CD11B positives. Bone marrow mononucleus from these mice. 
similar to histomorphomerical results, nuclear number power still class, and the bone resorption capacity was decreased in MBNP IG1 CKO and IGF1 CKO mice compared to MBNP and wild type, respectively. To confirm <coughs> our immunohistochemical findings that suggest that osteoclast IGF1 increased efferin B2 expression in osteoclast. We measured expression level of efferin B2 lysate tribe from highly purified osteoclast from in, in vitro. Osteoclast from IGF, osteoclast, osteoclast from MBNP IGF and CKO and IGM CKO mass had a decreased efferin B2 expression compared with MBNP and wild type mice respectively. These results suggest IGF1 is a much a con major contributor to efferin B2 expression of osteoclast. Since IGF1 produced by MBNP osteoclast induces efferin B2 on osteoclast and FB4 on osteoblast, we determine the differential potential of osteoblast precursor derived from long bone these mice. When MBNP osteoclast are co cultured with osteoblast from four genotype for 72 hours, FB4 Osterix and type 1 collagen level were upregulated on osteoblast MBNP mice compared to the wild type mice, but not osteoblast from MBNP IGF CKO or IGF and CKO mice. To brief summarize, increased efferin B2 and FB4 induced by osteoclast IGF1 enhanced bone formation and the pagetic bone region development in paget disease. Osteoclast IGF1 may contribute normal adult bone region remodeling. However, little is unknown about the contribute osteocyte to pagetic region. Next, we ask to paget osteoclast he regulatable normal bone remodeling contribute pathetic lesion formation. To determine sprotin expression by osteocyte in pathetic patient in vivo, we tested the bone biopsy section from pathetic patient and LC donor for sprotin expression. Importantly, osteocyte in the pathetic patient expressed decreased sclerosing and had shorter dendritic process compared to normal donor, which had osteocyte with well-developed dendritic process. To characterize potential effect of in increased osteoclast IGF on osteocyte in the patient disease, we stay in the bone section of hema from four genotype mice that 20 months old for sclerosing expression. Osteocyte in MD mice express lower level of sclerosing compared to osteocyte other genotypes. Further, osteocyte MD mice were morphologically abnormal and very short dendritic process compared to very developed dendritic process of osteocyte in other genotype mice. In addition, number of sclerotin expressing osteocyte MVNP mice was significantly decreased compared to the other genotypes. Canadic length osteocyte MVNP mice were significantly shorter than other genotypes. Importantly, serum levels were similar all genotypes. Next, we examine scrotin expression on the canalic rings pathetic region. These areas present numerous number of pathetic osteoclasts. Therefore, we assess 
if scratching expression level and morphology osteocyte adjacent pathetic region differ from those that were not. Scratching expression on the canonical rings osteocyte MVNP with wizard pathetic region was significantly reduced compared to wild type. Interestingly, scratching positive osteocyte number on the canonical rings osteocyte by bone area MVNP's pathetic region was significantly decreased compared to MVNP mice with the pathetic region and the wild type mice. Thus, osteocyte MV mice were abnormal. These results suggest that osteocyte potentially contributes to the induced osteoclast and the pathetic region formation. Next, we determined if osteocyte Maturation MVNP mice were delayed by assessing soft IGF messenger exhibition level in primary osteocyte. Primary osteocyte isolation from bone wild type MV mice at 20 months of age by coagulated digestion. Soft expression MV and osteocyte decreased obscurely 30% compared to wild type, but IGF-1 expression was similar to osteocyte from wild type and MVNP mice. As shown in right hand panels, the confocal microscopy view bone section and with undergoing immunochemical staining for dim and scrotching expression. Primary osteocyte MVNP mice also expressed detected level of dim one and scrotting compared to wild type. The mean intensity, DIMP1 and scrotting expression osteocyte from MVF mice was significantly lower than wild type mice. These results suggest osteocyte in MVF mice delayed maturation compared to osteocyte in wild type mice. There are many reported in which osteoclast formation is controlled by rank ligand from osteocyte. We examined rank ligand production by osteocyte in bone section at the 20 months of age mice. Rank ligand immunostaining bone section for, for genotype showed the MVNP mice. Osteocyte expressed increased rank ligand level compared to other genotype and wild type mice. Numbers of rank ligand positive osteocyte per bone area, MVNP mice was also higher than other genotype. Also, serum level of rank ligand was similar to all genotypes. We then measured the level of rank ligand messenger RNA and the production of rank ligand from osteocyte-like cell. Rank ligand messenger and expression level primary osteocytes and isolated coagulated digestion was also increased MV mice compared with wild type. Rank ligand production was measured bone growth cell that were cultured for 30 days. These cells expressed osteocyte marker protein, scrotting, and DIMP1. The primary osteocyte cell was cultured 72 hours, and the rank ligand pro production measured by ELISA. Osteocyte-like cells in MVF mice express higher level of rank ligand compared to osteoclast-like cell other genotypes. In summary, increased Frin B2, FB4 induced by osteoclast IGF1 enhanced bone formation and the pathetic region development the pathetic disease. Osteoclast IGF-1 may contribute to normal adult bone remodeling. Osteocyte and pathetic patient and MP mice are morphologically functionally abnormal and display delayed osteocyte maturation. Rank ligand expression by osteocyte from MP mice increased compared to wild type IGF and CKO and MVNP IGF and CKO mice. 
in conclusion, Avalido supported IGF-1 from osteoclast, primary driver pagetic osteoclast formation and pagetic region. We propose that small collection of pagetic osteoclast secrete high level, high local level of IGF-1 that include local rank ligand production from osteocyte, suppressed sclerosis expression, and enhanced pagetic osteocyte formation from osteocyte precursor that have hyper-responsive rank ligand. Increasing local level of osteoclast IGF-1 could result multiple every pagetic osteoclast formation that increase local bone destruction, which can induce local rapid bone formation via coupling factor FRIN B2 and FB4. IGF and further stimulate local bone formation and the development of pagetic region in bone site with low sclerosis level. Thus, we think osteocyte play an important role in the development and location of focal bone region for and osteoclast characteristic of pagetic region. Finally, I would like to acknowledge my, my collaborator. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Okay, great. At this time, um, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, hey, that was that was, oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> that was a great presentation. And I was just wondering, it's a very quick question, whether you measure the IGF receptor, IGF-1 receptor, whether, you know, in osteoclast or in osteocytes from the MB and P mice. Yes. I'm measuring so the so IGF receptor amount or the so osteoclast outside for genital similar level of IGF receptor expression. I have a previous report it, so Jesha insight for the, this regard. Okay, all right, thank you. And do you have a question you want to go ahead? Yes, please. No, I, I actually didn't have a question. I just thought it was lonely to not see everybody's faces. So that's why I'm, I came out. So it was a great okay. talk. I really enjoyed it. I okay, so I have a question for you. Thank you for the talk. Um, so you mentioned in your MVNP mice. Yes, uh, there was a reduction in the cannulicular length. Could you talk about what is the significance of that? Excuse me. Characteristic uh, MVNP mice. I'm sorry. Um, you said that the cannulicular length was reduced. Rank ligand production increased MVNP mice from osteocyte. Um, not the rank ligand, but you're talking about the cannuliculi? When you looked at the morphology of the, of the bone, you saw the cannuliculi. You said the, the osteocyte cannuliculi length was reduced. No. One more speak, one more so question. Can I re respond? Lack like and the production from osteocyte on the UV might decrease or not? Yeah, question. Um, no, I was thinking, I was I was speaking about the the morphology of the bone in your yes. MVNP mice. Yes. Uh, the cannuliculi around the associated with the osteocytes. The actual cannuliculi, you had said that the length of the cannuliculi was reduced. Can I respond to that, please? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think it's consistent with the, our findings of delayed maturation of the osteocytes and MVMP mice. And it's a reflection of the effects of IGF 1 on osteocytes. They're osteoid osteocytes, is the best way to describe them, mm -hmm. rather than mature osteocytes. Okay. at least based on our current findings. And we're still exploring that to try to understand the genetics of that uh, finding. And so how old were the mice at this 20 point? months old. 20 months. Yeah. And so what, what do you think, um, if you could speculate about 
what would be the physiological significance of having a reduced length? Would that interfere with communication? Lung ligand from osteocyte for the so induced for the osteocluster formation to MVNP for the so high hyper responsivity for the lung ligand for osteocluster precursor. So this lung ligand is strongly induced osteocluster formation. The case of the so in vitro experiment right. for the so co culture with osteocyte MVNP derived for and of osteoclast precursor from MPP and has a positive phenotype. Induced okay. rank ligand is also in this pathogenic induced pathogenic region for that mice also. This phenotype is examined for that in vivo, in vitro. Okay, thank you. Well, quickly, uh, DMP1 is associated with canonolicular dendritic development, and we find it's lower in these, uh, these osteocytes. And, and we haven't measured communication between them, but that's an important area we need to pursue. And hopefully we'll do it in our new grant. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Dr. Kurihara? Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you um, I would at this time like to invite Dr. Elizondo to begin his presentation. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see. This, okay. You guys can see my screen? Yes. yes. Perfect. All right. Hello, everyone. I am uh, happy today to share with you some of my lab's latest findings uh, on jumping exercise and sclerostin antibody as preventive countermeasures for uh, microgravity induced bone loss using a uh, rat model for spaceflight. So, here's kind of the order of business for the day. We're going to start with a quick introduction of the problem, talk about what our study wanted to accomplish, the design we used to accomplish that, get to the good stuff with the results and discussion, and then wrap everything up and have some time for questions at the end. So the problem that we're looking at here is bone loss in space. When astronauts go to space, they lose gravitational loading on their spine and bones of their legs. And so these bones start to rapidly deteriorate because these bone really quite rapidly in space if they're not protected by some sort of countermeasure. And most of that bone is cancellous bone. So we're really concerned with cancellous bone loss in astronauts in space. And uh, what NASA and other agencies on the ISS currently use to counteract bone loss is exercise. You see here the A-red device in use, which is the, the current exercise device on the ISS. And uh, traditionally, it's been thought to be very, very effective at preventing and you know, almost eliminating bone loss. Uh, but as our evaluation techniques have progressed beyond DEXAs, uh, researchers have started using QCT and some finite element simulation. More recently, they've started to find that maybe exercise wasn't as effective as we always thought it was. They still found some bone loss through QCT and finite element simulation at retrieval uh, disks. So it's possible that if we're starting to question the efficacy of exercise on ISS missions, that it might be, um, the bone loss might be worse on a Mars mission that NASA is, is currently planning because the duration of the Mars mission is going to be much longer, maybe two to three times longer or sorry, two to three years, uh, whereas ISS missions are six months, mostly. So astronauts going to Mars will be in space for a very long time, and then they'll also be on Mars for a little while but in reduced gravity. So it's possible that uh, NASA might want to look into something to supplement exercise. And in the past, they've looked at osteoporosis drug treatments. They looked at alendronate. They found that it was pretty effective, um, but decided to stick with exercise alone. 
So we thought maybe a new drug, uh, anti-sclerosing antibody, would be useful for this purpose as well. Um, it's known as romosozumab in humans, and this drug is incredibly effective, produces uh, a large anabolic response by suppressing sclerostin signaling from osteocytes. Sclerostin normally uh, increases resorption and lowers formation. So when you block it, um, you get a really robust anabolic response that acts on both resorption and on formation. So we wanted to administer this drug in our study. And we wanted to do that with a Heinlein unloading rat model, which is a very common analog for space flight. We wanted to simulate resistance exercise with a voluntary jump training technique that we developed in our lab. Um, and, and since it's kind of something new that we're trying in the lab, we wanted to first start by validating it to make sure that our jumping was producing the elevated loading that we thought it was and to make sure that that was actually building bone. Then after we validated our jumping technique, we wanted to compare it to this drug treatment and see which of them or if both of them were effective at preventing bone loss in microgravity or, or in disuse. And so here is our study design. We started with a conditioning period, basically where we trained the rats to jump. Then after that, we had our pretreatment period we did either jumping or sclerosome antibody for four weeks. Then after that period, all treatment was ceased and rats went into hind limb unloading for four weeks. After that, they were taken down from unloading and left to recover for eight weeks. And at each kind of major milestone, we sacrificed some animals so we could use their bones for ex vivo outcomes. We compared the treatment groups to two control groups. Hind limb unloading control had uh, no pretreatment but did go through unloading and the control animals just sort of sat in their cages for their entire study. We use this HU model, uh, very standard tail traction model for four weeks with eight weeks of recovery afterwards. Our drug was from Eli Lilly. We injected with their dosing scheme 25 milligrams per kilogram body weight once a week for four weeks. And uh, our voluntary jump training was unique in that it used positive reinforcement instead of negative reinforcement. So we basically bribed the rats to jump with sugar treats that smelled like Tootsie Rolls. And in that way, we got them to jump up to 10 inches high, 30 jumps a day, five days a week for four weeks. So they're really pretty active athletic rats. And you can see one in action here. He's setting up for his jump. He jumps. Here's the treats on the click, goes back for the treats. Then he does some sniffing which is a rat's favorite activity. And then he'll turn around, get ready for another jump. Here's his treat reward, comes back down, gets his treats. And he'll just keep repeating that until we stop giving him treats, until we do that 30 times. So we wanted to start by making sure that that jumping that you just saw was producing elevated loading and was building bone. So to do that, we're looking at the bones of the animals right after the 28-day exercise period, comparing those to bones of unexercised animals. And we are looking at the forces that these animals produce during jumping uh, with this ground reaction force measurement system here. It's a very simple setup. It only measures force in the vertical direction. Uh, and we're gonna supplement that with some ex vivo PQCT and some static and dynamic histomorphometry. And so to start, we'll look at the ground reaction force results. On the left, you see mean peak ground reaction force, or GRF. Uh, and what that means is basically, this is the hardest the rats ever pushed into the ground during the jump and during the landing. And so you can see that both during the jump and the landing, there was a, a massively increased peak force compared to the rat's body weight, which is great. It means that we're getting some elevation and loading, which we thought we were getting. Uh, and interestingly, the jump and the landing have almost identical peak forces. Uh, what is maybe not identical though, is the rate at which the force is applied during the jump and the landing. It appears to be quite a bit higher during the forelimb landing than the jump or the hind limbs. Uh, but we couldn't say that with 95% confidence uh, because our N was very small, we had an N of four. For some reason, the rats were uh, quite scared by the addition of the load cells and the wires underneath the cage. So only four of them jumped, four out of 15 of them. Uh, so we're a little disappointed in that. 
but this P of 0.125 is actually the highest uh, confidence you can achieve with the non-parametric test that we did. So uh, we think it's, it's a reasonable indication that there is maybe some difference in loading rate between landing and jumping. And that might be important as we analyze some of these coming results in the bones of the rats. Um, so at the femur and humerus, we measured cortical VBMD, and we found that jumping animals had a denser cortical bone, which is great. We also looked at cancellous bone volume by histomorphometry in the tibia and humerus, and found again that jumping animals had more bone volume than control animals that were unexercised. So that's great. It looks like our jumping is both elevating loading and building bone. And if you note over on the right panel, it looks like the humerus might have a stronger response than the tibia in the histomorphometry. And this holds true as well when we look at bone turnover. Bone formation rate was elevated in jumping animals compared to control animals, elevated seemingly more strongly at the humerus, although we didn't do any uh, statistical comparison between the two bones. And then we looked at osteoclast surface as well, which was reduced in jumping animals compared to controls at both sites but again, a greater percent decrease at the humerus compared to the tibia. So uh, our jumping protocol seems to be working. We're elevating vertical ground reaction force relative to body weight. We're building bones. And it's possible that we're creating a more anabolic response in the humerus compared to the tibia, so in the forelimbs compared to the hind limbs. And we think this might be true for uh, two reasons. The first is that we measured ground reaction forces and, and not strain on the bone. Strain on the bone is what causes remodeling, so the ground reaction force is just kind of a surrogate for that. So it's possible that the same peak ground reaction force that we saw between the jump and the landing could lead to different strain rates, uh, maybe higher strain values in the humerus compared, compared to in the tibia. Also, the higher rate of force development that we probably saw from the landing compared to the jump could lead to a more uh, yeah, more bone anabolism. We know that if you load a bone faster, it's going to respond more strongly to the loading than if you load it at a slower rate. So it's possible that it's the, uh, the kind of the sharper impact of landing that's driving the difference we see in the humerus compared to the tibia. So now that we're pretty sure, we, we know that jumping is doing what we think it's doing, it's elevating loading, it's building bone, we want to compare it to our drug treatment sclerosis and antibody and assess how effective both of those are at preventing disuse-induced bone loss. So to do that, we're taking ex vivo measurements at the end of each major time point, the end of pretreatment, end of unloading, end of recovery. And our first measure is microcomputer tomography at the uh, distal femur metaphysis. So we're looking at the cancellous bone at the distal femur. And we find pretty strong results for the sclerostin antibody, which is the purple columns there. So sclerostin produced higher BVTV, higher trabecular thickness, and higher tissue mineral density at uh, some time points compared to other groups, compared to both jumping and reference, depending on the time point you look at. The jumping animals, which are in green, the green checkered, uh, really didn't have much action in DVTV or trabecular thickness at first. So at the end of the jumping period, it seemed like nothing had happened. But if you compare those green bars to the red bars, which are the hind limb unloading control animals, the green bars are higher than the red at the end of the unloading period. So even though jumping didn't seem to do much at first, it did provide some sort of uh, delayed benefit because the animals that went through the same period of unloading as the jumping animals had lower bone loss or lower uh, bone outcomes when they were not protected by jumping. So that's encouraging. Um, but we, what we think is really cool is that sclerostin is enhancing both the volume of bone we have and sort of its quality. So we've improved BVTV with sclerostin, we've improved trabecular thickness, and we've also improved tissue mineral, mineral density, which is uh, sort of a measure of, of how mineralized just the bone tissue is. So you would expect that these bigger and probably higher quality bones of the sclerostin animals are much stronger than all the other bones. So we set out to uh, answer that question with a mechanical test. What we did is we cut a 
slice from the bone, the same slice that we scanned with Micro CT. We physically took it out of the bone. And then we compressed just the inner cancellous region of that slice so that we're loading only cancellous bones. We're testing the cancellous strength, which is what we're most concerned about in space flight. And we see the same trends that we saw before, but really greatly exaggerated here. So sclerostin bones are massively increased compared to other groups in elastic modulus, which is uh, basically material level stiffness, in yield stress and ultimate stress, which are different measures of material strength. And again, we see that the jumping animals don't really have much going on at the end of the unloading, or at the end of the jumping period at day 28. But then if you look at day 56, the jumping is again higher than the high limb unloading control group. So the green is higher than the red. So again, there's some sort of delayed benefit of jumping, even though it doesn't seem to be immediately effective uh, compared to control animals. But again, the, the real star here looks like is the sclerostin treated animals. So sort of wrap everything up. We started by validating our jumping protocol. We found that we elevated ground reaction force relative to body weight and we built bone. So that's great. We found that that jumping was uh, moderately effective. It, it moderated the negative effects of simulated microgravity through unloading. And sclerostin did the same, but sclerostin seemed to be much more effective than jumping in the cancellous bone, um, both at the structural and at the material level. And we think that's really what makes sclerostin antibody such a promising candidate for space blood countermeasures, that it has these long lasting uh, and, and pretty pronounced effects in cancellous bone. And it's working both at the structural level and it appears to be working at the material level as well. Uh, so we think that if NASA is interested in pursuing some sort of uh, drug countermeasure to supplement exercise on the way to Mars, or maybe preventive before the astronauts go into space, we think that Celestin antibody would be a strong candidate for that. So I'd like to just acknowledge all the collaborators and uh, funding sources that made this study possible. Thank you to them. I'd like to open the floor for any questions that you might have. Thank you. That was a nice presentation, John. Thank you. So I have a couple of questions. Um, yeah. So I'm assuming those were Sprague Dolly rats? Yes, yes, male Sprague Dolly, six months old. Six months old. Yeah. Um, and so you talked about the, so the impact, the force development mm -hmm. between the hind limb, the femur, and also the humerus. Yeah. Um, can you explain what the rate of force development means? Rate of force development is, um, you could would compare it to uh, basically loading rate in uh, all those external loading studies, you know, the, the sort of the classic external loading studies, they would uh, push on the bone with varying frequencies and a higher loading rate is a higher force development. So it means that you're applying the force, the same force, but you're applying it more quickly. So in, instead of maybe leaning into a wall and, and pushing on it really hard you're just kind of like impacting it real quickly with the same force but you're applying the force much faster that means that they kind of jump down off the platform quicker than they jumped up yes exactly exactly they, they kind of impact more sharply whereas the jumping is more of a uh, there's a longer period of time over which they're applying that force into the ground mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So we we also know that um, with astronauts, they're you know they're highly fit. They obviously undergo mm -hmm. an exercise training protocol prior to flight. Right. Um, had did you consider doing a combination group where you would have both the antibody treatment as well as the exercise protocol? Yes, we uh, we did, but we we thought that what we really wanted to focus on was the comparison, and we already use so many animals for this study. We, uh, we didn't want to go adding more. It was a very large study, a lot of animal use. We thought that um, it would have definitely been interesting to look at that for sure. Um, but we thought that it was more responsible to just stick to the, the comparison between the two. But yeah, that's a, maybe a missed opportunity that we might regret down the line, who knows. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
So it, it looks like we had a question in the chat. So it says, uh, what would happen when you stop the anti-sclerostin? After the treatment, would you lose the effects? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, in humans, it seems like you do. Um, so in, in humans, it looks like sclerostin uh, romosozumab is really very effective, I think, for the first year or so. But after that, it, it sort of stops working. And we didn't see that in our rats. So if you look at these graphs, uh, we ceased treatment here at day 28. Uh, and, and we don't really see any drastic bone loss throughout the study. Uh, maybe if we had extended it beyond day 112, if we had let them recover for maybe another month or something, we would have seen the effect wear off. And then maybe like you were saying that the, since they have so much bone and this drug is, not, no, is no longer sort of tricking the, the rats into making more bone, maybe they would lose a bunch of bone to go back to control levels. Um, but we didn't see that in this study. Um, so, so maybe it's possible that since romosozumab is usually used in, you know, in older um, osteoporotic women and, and patients who are already in sort of an unhealthy bone state, when the treatment is ceased, then the sort of, they call it rebound bone loss. It might occur very quickly, but maybe since these rats are, you know, reasonably healthy, they're not, they don't have any predisposed bone conditions, maybe uh, administering sclerostin and then ceasing doesn't have those, those drawbacks. And maybe we'd have see the same in astronauts. We, we don't know. Yeah, that, that's, that's one question that we, we were hoping to see um, an answer to here. And, and we, we, yeah, we don't really know what happens if we take this out further, um, but we didn't see any bone loss from ceasing the treatment in this study. Can you show your micro CT data? Yeah. And this is the femur? Yes, both of these are distal femur metaphysis. Have you looked at the humerus, the micro CT? Uh, no, not with, not with micro CT. Because um, we, the humerus wasn't unloaded since the rats were in the tail traction, they were uh, fully loaded. In fact, maybe the humerus is even a little overloaded during hind limb unloading. Uh, so we, for the, the major outcomes, we wanted to focus on the hind limbs, which went through the disease period. So no, we have not done humus. Okay. I have one quick question for you. It's a little mm -hmm. bit about the experimental design. Yeah. So the, the animals that got the treats, did the, did the control animals also get the same treats, Steve? Were you concerned about the calories yes. and, and that kind of thing? Yeah, we, we uh, every day when we would jump train the rats, the, the lazy control rats got a, you know, a pellet packet of 30 uh, sugar treats as well. So yeah, everyone benefited. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I wonder, did you notice anything when you were doing the sacrificing about changes in the other, you know, muscular skeletal tissues like the muscles or, you know, tendons? Was there anything obvious that uh, um, looked different between those animals? Yes, they were some very, very uh, muscular rats, yeah. Is that um, right? Okay. Yeah, we have, uh, I believe we have gastroc data somewhere, but I don't have it here, but, but yes. The, okay, okay. Yeah, well, you, I think you, I, you I might tell reach out to you and, and yeah. talk to you about some of that, because I, I have some ideas, but, and your work is really interesting. So okay. thanks for yeah, the talk. Great. Yeah, thank you. So even with the high limb and loading period, um, did you see that the muscles had maintained their mass after high limb and loading? Hmm. I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah. I can check and get back to you if you'd like. We, we do have that data somewhere. We, we take soleus data, which is uh, generally a, how we confirm that the unloading was done properly. Uh, soleus is a postural muscle that really rapidly degrades during hind limb unloading. Mm. Um, so I can check that and I can check for gastric weight if you'd like, um, but I don't know right off the top of my head if the uh, muscular gains persisted through unloading. I would expect maybe not as much as the bone gains because muscle tends to remodel much quicker. Mm. Uh, so I, I would bet that there were more muscular losses than, than bone losses in our rats. Okay. Have you considered looking at the, maybe doing like some subsequent studies looking at, not necessarily repeating the studies, but 
analyzing tissue, like for example, if you stay, save the humerus, do you have plans to do micro CT on the humerus? Uh, uh, not currently. We, we could, um, we have a, our collaborator has a micro CT and he's been uh, very, very helpful in that regard. So uh, yeah, we could. Um, we, we have some other outcomes that we want to take care of first. We have some um, some serum analysis we want to do and, and a little bit more histomorphometry, but maybe down the line we would be looking into, yeah, humerus, okay. uh, some spines as well. So, yeah. Okay. Very nice studies. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question, um, and it was a really nice presentation. I agree with all the previous one. My question is whether, I mean, I heard some studies that actually looked at the rusting effect in metabolic features, like, you know, adipocytes, uh, mm -hmm. you know, more food intake and things like that. Have you, have you looked at, uh, you know, some metabolic features of these rats? And also I would like to add, if you take a look at the markers of bone uh, turnover and circulation as well, if that leads to the same uh, conclusion. Yeah, um, we haven't looked at uh, any uh, metabolic stuff. Uh, we didn't measure food intake. We fed these rats ad lib. Um, we have body weights. Uh, and I don't think the sclerostin animals were uh, different in that regard. But we do, we do have serum measures that we're going to be looking at for yeah, systemic uh, measures of bone turnover. Um, we just haven't gotten to it yet. Okay, thank you. Yep. Well, great. I know we are just a minute away from the top of the hour. So I wanted to take this time to thank both of our presenters um, for two great presentations and then just share um, with everyone the next uh, member spotlight series, um, just in case you all weren't aware, this is a part of a, a monthly series. Um, and the next spotlight will take place on Wednesday, July 28th at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and you can read information on both of our presenters here. Um, if you registered for this session, you should also have received the calendar invitation for next session and the um, future scheduled sessions. But if not, you can always re-register um, at the link on our website there. And um, this session recording will also be posted on the ASBMR um, YouTube channel. So um, with that, thank you to our presenters again, and I hope to see um, everyone next month. Thanks, everybody.